Once I was in San Francisco, walking along the Golden Gate Bridge, and I saw this guy on the bridge about to jump. I thought I'd try to stall him, detain him, long enough for me to put the film in. I said, don't jump, and he turns. You've heard of the elephant man. He had the head like the head of a horse. And my heart went out to him. I said, why the long face? <laughs> he said, all my life, people have called me cruel names like Flicka or Trigger, silver, chess piece. I said, well, don't worry about it, Ed. <laughs> it can't be that bad. He said, oh, yeah? How would you like to go through your whole life as a freak? I said, well, he said, well, you're a bad example. <laughs> I said, come on. You're not the only person in this world saddled with a few problems. <laughs> Besides, you're forgetting about God. He said, how do you know there's a God? I said, of course there's a God. Do you think billions of years ago, a bunch of molecules floating around at random without rhyme or reason could someday have had the sense of humor to make you look like that. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I used to believe in God. I said, that's good. Were you a Christian or a Jew? He said, a Christian. I said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. I said, me too. What franchise? <laughs> he says, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist or Northern Conservative Reform Baptist? He says, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Great Lakes Region. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Eastern Region. He says, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Great Lakes Region. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Great Lakes Region, Council of 1879. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Great Lakes Region, Council of 1912. He says, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Great Lakes Region, Council of 1912. I said, die, heretic. And I pushed him over. <laughs> Emo Phillips, 1989. While the, uh, the video production, the outfit, the crowd is a little dated, the joke is not. You know, they say the best comedians are funny because they make comments about truth. And isn't it amazing how quickly we are, how quickly we, we chastise and ridicule and are wanting to distance ourselves from others in the body of Christ over things that just sometimes don't matter. And I know things do matter, and I know things don't matter, and, and I know it's hard, but do you know we are told that the world will know us by the way that we love each other. And what makes Emo Phillips' sketch both funny and not funny is this is what the world hears. Um, this is what they see. In fact, our rhetoric comes to us with an implied message. Actually, the implied message is the title of my sermon. It's intended to be hyperbole. It's intended to be satirical, and it's intended to tick you off. Here's the title of my sermon. 
I'm right, everybody's stupid, thank God for me. Because, because that is exactly what we sound like. It's exactly what we sound like. Acts 15. I wish we could read Acts 15 and recognize just how revolutionary, incendiary, life altering Acts chapter 15 is. Indeed, apart from Pentecost, I think Acts chapter 15 is one of the most important chapters in the book of Acts. Ministry to the Gentile world hinges upon this chapter. And here's what had been going on. <coughs> About 20 years had passed, maybe a little bit less than Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And, and you know the story, last week was Pentecost, uh, they were gathered, uh, the Spirit of God was poured out upon all flesh, 3,000 were added to their number, they were to wait into Jerusalem until the promised Holy Spirit, and then at some point they were supposed to go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world with this proclamation. Well, sometimes we've not always been good at doing that of our own volition, so what did it take? It took persecution. We read about this in Acts chapter 7. Stephen, uh, Stephen, the first martyr of the church, was stoned to death. You remember Saul, the young Saul, was there giving approval to all of this as the Pharisees and the religious leaders stoned uh, Stephen to death on the testimony of Christ. And at the end of that passage, it says, that very day persecution broke out against the church, and the church was scattered. They were forced out of Jerusalem. So now, here's all of these Jews going into a very Greek, Gentile world. Did you know Christianity didn't start off as Christianity? Christianity started off as a sect of Judaism. It was a part of Judaism. It was a Jewish, Jesus was a Jewish Messiah, and these people were teaching that the Jewish scriptures had been fulfilled in Jesus. This was an in-house matter. At this point, Christianity was not a thing. In fact, the name Christian doesn't appear until later, and it's almost by accident. It was meant as a derogatory term, all those little Christs. Who do they think they are? And we kind of adopted it. Prior to that, they were just Jews who were followers of the way. Well, Guess what every Jew, every male Jewish boy had had done? Presumably, on the eighth day of life, sometimes if they had come to the faith later, much later, it, it was one of those procedures that got worse with time. <laughs> but every Jewish boy had been circumcised. Why? The Bible said so. And what were they reading in, ch in church? Uh, less than 20 years had passed since Jesus' ascension. What were they reading in church? Maybe some of Paul's letters were beginning to circulate. Maybe 1 Thessalonians. Maybe. Maybe. But what they were reading in church was Jewish scriptures. And you cannot read the Old Testament and walk away from it and think, well, I don't need to be circumcised. <laughs> you can't. Any more than you can walk away from reading the New Testament and go, well, I don't have to be baptized. It's there. It's, it's in the Bible. So can you imagine the debate? Here's these Jews going out. They're followers of the way. This Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He's been raised. They're telling this message, but they're Jews. Now they're going to uh, the Greek culture, the Greek world. And the Greeks are like, whoa, time out. Do what? <laughs> Do what? I'm 48 years old and you want me to what? Like, um, time out. We've got questions. We've got questions. Well, God honors the righteousness of this. Well, then I'll take two. You know, that, that's a line from Robin Hood Men in Tights. Don't quote me on that. Um, but... Uh, Right, I mean, this is, this, is, this is what's going on in the church. You know how huge this is? This is a biblical issue. The Bible says, and all we have to do is fold our arms, quote our Bible verse, and say, there you go. 
If you don't like it, get out. Hmm. This is exactly what's going on in Acts chapter 15. Isn't that shattering to a lot of our preconceived ideas? You see, we get so hung up on what divides that we have made an enemy out of everybody and everything who differs in thought, in doctrine, in ideology, in whatever it is. I'm right. You're stupid. Thank God for me. That's the message we give. Um, just to prove my point, I came up with a bunch of statements that are intended to tick you all off. Uh, it's, so here we go. Here we go. Um, I, I probably shouldn't get glee out of this. I, I do a little bit. Okay, so if I say something like, I follow Christ and am part of the evangelical world, most of you will hear something that indeed the world hears as well. You will hear things like, if, if I say I'm a follower of Christ and I'm part of the evangelical world, you will hear, I vote Republican, I, 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 everything I disagree with politically is all socialism, um, the Second Amendment is endorsed by the New Testament, and the only thing worse than a Democrat is an intestinal worm. <laughs> See, if I follow Christ and say I'm an evangelical world, that's implicitly what you hear. Everybody is so stupid. If they just knew what I knew, then the world would be okay. If they just believed exactly what I believe, then there wouldn't be any problems. What if I said something like, here we go, now you're going to get mad. What if I said something like, it's because I've read the New Testament that I don't own a weapon that's designed to kill another human? Somehow, I'm less of a Christian for saying that. Or what if I said, it's because I've read the Bible that I believe that we have an ecological responsibility to the planet, which often requires legislation. For many of you, that makes me a progressivist. Or what if I said, it's because I've listened to the voice of Scripture that I believe that my responsibility to life persists even after a child is born, that being anti-abortion is not the same as being pro-life. Hmm. Or what if I said, as is commonly stated, I believe that the Bible insists that we follow the laws of the land so long as they do not conflict with the laws of Scripture. I've said that, amen? Amen. That's true. We follow the laws of the land so long as they do not conflict with the laws of Scripture. But apparently for Christians, speed limits conflict with the law of Scripture. Huh. Maybe there needs to be some consistency in our life. What if I said that we have a responsibility, a responsibility to listen to the voice of our youth, the disenfranchised and the forgotten, who are leaving the faith in droves? What if I said we need to shut up and listen to what they're saying? rather than shut them down and push them out. All we want to do is tell them how wrong they are, how stupid they are, how lazy they are, and how the world needs less of them and more of us. What if I said that they are worth listening to without getting all wound up? What if I said I believe that the Bible speaks of the sanctity of marriage and sexuality in terms of heterosexual unions? I would get amens for that, but I would also be accused of being a narrow-minded fundamentalist. But if I turn around and I say that I also believe that we need to have a better conversation in the church about the issue of same-sex attraction, and that same-sex attraction is not the same as same-sex sex, well, then I'm just a progressive liberal. Holiness, you see, for us is apparently an unwillingness to have actual conversation without folding our arms and looking at others smugly over the rim of our glasses. Hmm. Or what if I say that racism still is a problem? Well, then I'm woke, and I don't even know what that means. Or I'm ignorant, or I'm foolish, but I'm definitely white. Oh, I know, someone's going to find a video and you're going to send it to me of that one black dude or that one Hispanic woman who supports your views and you're going to be like, Pastor, you just need to watch this one person. Or if I say that I'm convinced that most wars are politically motivated and that all of them are outside of God's will, well then, especially on this weekend of all weekends, I'm not patriotic. 
because I hate war. <laughs> and of course, patriotism is the same as Christianity. God bless America and no place else. Okay. Do you know how long I could keep doing this? Because this is the rhetoric. I'm right. You're stupid. Thank God for me. I don't have to keep going down this list because this is exactly what we sound like. Everybody is an expert. Everybody is a pundit. Everybody knows the right answers. And everybody else is wrong. If everybody would just listen to me, then everybody would be better for it. Apparently, our denominations function the same as Jesus. Apparently, our political regimes do the same work as Jesus. Apparently, our opinions are the same as Jesus. Apparently, Jesus doesn't need to be Jesus anymore because we've got it covered on Fox News, the Nazarene Church, and under the bill of our mega cap. There, now everyone's mad. Maybe we can better appreciate Acts chapter 15. People came in with their Bibles open, with their opinions in tow. And there was rigorous debate. There was great conversation. And somehow the church stayed united. Can I tell you, I'm not anti-denominational. I'm not. I believe denominations are a way for us to actually get along. I always compare it to my family. We live under one roof, an umbrella, of sorts. We're all sheltered under the same principles and we all gather around one table. But in order for the Jewets to live peacefully together, we need an Abby Jewett space, a Tim Jewett space, a Zach Jewett space, and an Emily Jewett space. I got that out of order. We need a mom and dad space, but those spaces apparently are common spaces. Um, uh, but, but everybody, in order to get along, we all have to have our space, but we still live under one roof. We eat around one table because we are one family. And do we have our differences? Yes, and thank God. But it's our differences that make us. Instead, as Paul would point out in his letters, we like it when our, the hands of Christ's body attack the feet of Christ's body, attack the knees of Christ's body. A hand is not a foot, a foot is not a knee, a knee is not a forearm. We need all of this to be a body. We are the body of Christ, and this nonsense of I'm right, you're stupid, thank God for me, is not Christian. It is not Christian. Can I tell you, the meanest people I know are Christians. The most unkind people I know are Christians. Maybe it's because I hang out mostly with Christians. That could be part of the problem, and it is a problem. But some of the worst people I know are Christians. Some years ago now, I was visiting with a lady who was old and mean just mean all the time. And I never understood how you could claim the name of Christ and be that mean. But I look at the state of the church and that's exactly what we are. We're just mean. So, what is this sermon? Am I, am I changing biblical principles? Am I saying we need to change our position on anything? No, not at all. Not at all. The sermon is not about that. The sermon is how to be <laughs> agreeable. Who was the first person to say, well, we're going to have to agree to disagree? Probably didn't know this. It was John Wesley, our namesake. Our namesake. Uh, so this is a way for us to be agreeable. Let me give you some just real straightforward common sense principles. This is not a come to Jesus sermon. This is a start acting like Jesus sermon. <laughs> Maybe our coming to Jesus needs to happen in behavior and not just at an altar. Maybe the altar of the world is where our confession that we confessed as a congregation earlier really needs to occur. Maybe in how we respond to each other in the, within denominations or within the faith or, or on social media. Maybe, maybe this is what confession and repentance really looks like rather than some weepy-eyed prayer 
while we repeat just as I am for the umpteenth time. So let me make some common lowbrow principles out of this. Number one, we saw Peter stand up. Notice in verses 6 through 7, it says that the apostles and the elders were gathered together, together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, notice, we can debate without dividing. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, and then he goes on. Here's the first principle. Be willing to converse, even debate, without dividing. What does love demand? Love demands that you don't divide over the things that you disagree with. Um, and so be willing to converse, even debate, without dividing. What this is going to mean is that you're going to have to take a stand, even if it's a minority position. Peter, who did vacillate on this issue, read, read Galatians chapter 2. Peter, who did vacillate on this issue, he had to take a stand. He had to stand up for something. Oh, we're good about standing up and, and talking out. But we do it, it seems, so often in a way that alienates everybody else. So take a stand, yes, but we need to stay humble in the process. Notice what Peter says. He's giving testimony to the Spirit in their life by saying, he said, I saw the Spirit come upon them and they, hadn't even, they didn't even know what a moil was. <laughs> They had never been to a procedure room. They didn't know about circumcision, yet I saw the Spirit come upon them. And he said, it's the Spirit of God who knows their heart. Who are you, O oh man, to say what is in the heart of another? Several months ago, I had someone come up after the service and we had shared in communion, something we're not doing today. Because I think the body of Christ needs to be made whole, and I'm not sure we are. Um, but they come up after communion. They said, Pastor, you know such and such, such and such should not be coming to this table. I said, why not? And they said, well, I know their heart. They are not right with God. And you're supposed to be right with God, completely forgetting that this meal was and that the cross was given for sinners. You've got to be right with God. And I said, well, is there something you know that I need to know? And they said, no, I just know in my spirit. Shut up. Can you believe that? Stay humble. You do not know the heart of another. Take a stand. Stay humble. And then there was this point when everybody had said what they needed to say and it was somebody else's time to talk. They stayed quiet. You see it right there in verse 12. And the whole assembly fell silent. There is a point when you've got to stay silent. Some of you are like, yeah, pastor, look at the clock. Now's that time now's the time right but there is a point we are so quick our idea of disagreeing is to talk over everybody else to be louder than to be more obnoxious than there is a time to stay quiet because you cannot listen while you're talking period we've got to listen we're not listening we're just pulling out our Bible verses and launching, launching spiritual hand grenades. So, the first thing, be willing to converse, even debate, which means take a stand, but stay humble and stay quiet when your turn is done. Very practical. Here's the second thing. Be willing to change. <laughs> you know how that goes over, saying that to a church of, of Christians who have been Christian most of your life? Be willing to change. Um, wow, Galatians 2, here's something dramatic that happened. Paul talks about how Peter was being inconsistent. You remember this story? Paul, they were in Antioch, and Paul, never one to uh, know when to bite his tongue, Paul sees Peter. Peter was eating with the Gentiles. He's like, yeah, another round of jalapeno poppers with the bacon wrap. Bring it on, right? Bring it on. And then, and then it says, some Jews from Jerusalem came up and notice it says some Jews sent by James <laughs> the same James who is the brother of Jesus who had a long history of being very dogmatic in his faith extra biblical history shows us he was one of those very rigid 
ascetic kind of Christians. And so James, it appears, the brother of Jesus, had sent these Jews up to or down to Antioch in order to make sure that these Gentiles were keeping kosher. And as soon as they showed up, Peter was like, yeah, I'm, I'm totally kosher. Like, that's kosher. Are you kosher? I'm kosher. This is all kosher. And, and Paul was like, you're being inconsistent. Paul called him out on this. And now here we are in this Jerusalem council, and the very one who sent the Jews to make sure everybody was following the rules is now the same one who hears the arguments and goes, you're right. They shouldn't have to be circumcised. Huh. Somehow we've gotten it in our heads that an unwillingness to change our positions, our beliefs, is faithfulness. And sometimes our unwillingness to change is actually a lack of faith. Huh. So here it is. Be willing to change. An unchanging faith is an atrophied faith. You're just going to become lazy. And you're not going to flex that muscle anymore. Well, I don't need to do it. We've been doing it this way since 1633. I just made that date up. If that date has any correlation to anybody else, I sincerely apologize because it just popped into my head. Um, but, but we've been doing it this way for so long that we don't have to do it any other way. And when our faith is not stretched, our muscle is atrophied. And it becomes an act of faithlessness. Be willing to change. An unchanging faith is an atrophied faith. Uh, do not lay unnecessarily heavy burdens upon others. Your walk is not their walk. Your job is to walk with them. We baptize Lydia. Her job now is not to catechize everybody in the nursery. Her job is to be catechized by the teachers. She's in that stage where she's expected to be instructed. If we lay burdens upon her that are un, unfit for her age or her time or her maturity, we will lose her. And we do this in the church as well, spiritually, especially with the weak in faith. So do not lay unnecessary, unnecessarily heavy burdens upon others. And do not shy away from what is saying good, from saying what is good even necessary for them to grow in faith. Notice, he said, yeah, you guys don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be circumcised, but, but the sexual immorality, um, th stay away from all idols, meat that has blood in it, all of this had to do with temple worship. In other words, this was your life, stay away from that part of your life. Right? We can give good instruction to our kids. We do it all of the time. Stay away from that. That's going to be a problem. We need to do this. We need to be able to speak up with other Christians as well. Live and let die is what the Beatles said, not what Jesus said. We live so that others may live as well. So do not shy away from saying what is good. And then finally, let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. Did you know... I, well, you do know this because I subject you to it on a regular basis. I love theology. I love talking about theology. I love parsing theology. I love arguing theology. I love proving that I am right, you're stupid, and thank God for me. I love that. <laughs> like, I love this. But did you know my theology, the Nazarene doctrine, or anybody else's theology does not save? Jesus saves. Good doctrine is necessary. Good doctrine doesn't save. You can have good doctrine and go to hell. You can have good theology and go to hell. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. It's the Holy Spirit's job to be the Holy Spirit. It's our job to be the body of Christ. And what does the body of Christ do? It gives itself sacrificially for the life of the world. There's a kindness in this. We would rather defend our faith with our bombs and ballistics than to demonstrate our faith with a cross. Yet that's exactly what Jesus did. And so I leave you with some very practical principles, but it all boils down to one thing. We are saved by grace through faith. 
And this is a gift of God, not by works so that no one should boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. For by grace you have been saved. The grace of God. So I say to you, to us, to the church, guess what? Even if you're right, you can be wrong. Being right. And guess what? You're not the smartest person on the planet. Not even close. Not even in the room. Guess what? Just because it comes out of somebody else's mouth that you disagree with doesn't mean it's all rubbish. Guess what? The body of Christ has many parts. And if we're to be the body of Christ, we are to be made whole by the Spirit. So here's the invitation today. Usually we make whole by sharing in this broken body of Christ. And when that bo broken body is shared in communion, co-union, the body of Christ is made whole. But today I see a very fractured church. Not just here, but I see a fractured church. Maybe today our communion is the act of worship of going and being Christ in the world in the unity of the Spirit, knowing that we are saved by God's amazing grace. Amen? Amen. You can all go home mad. <laughs> or you can all go home knowing that God's Spirit is greater than any of our opinions and that God is smarter than we are and God is God's answer, not me, not you, not even the Church of the Nazarene. God is God's answer. That's the grace that saves us. We're going to sing that song. Stephen's going to bring his band up, and we're going to sing Amazing Grace. Don't we need to sing Amazing Grace? This is going to be our uh, kind of our, uh, our rallying cry, and as we sing this, know that the grace that you have received now is a responsibility. You see, every gift bears an obligation. Every grace given is an obligation to bear that grace in the world around you in a way that is redemptive. May Acts 15 teach us that the body of Christ looks, sounds, and acts very different in different places and at different times. We can be in the culture without ever changing the truth of God's word. So may we recognize that it's God's amazing grace that saves us. Stand and sing with us.